I love movies a lot. I have probably spent about 10% of my life just watching films. And for a while I wanted to make some video on my favorite movies, but I never felt there was much to say about them, other than they are good movies or to end up repeating what many other channels had already said about them. But to break away from the mold of making videos about things that I don't like, I decided I can just group all of my favorite movies together and talk about them in a single video. Also, I restricted myself to one movie per director, as otherwise I felt there might not be as much of a variety. So if you're looking for a film recommendation or are a film nerd like myself, strap yourself in and enjoy the video. The list is in no particular order, as I find them to all be of roughly equal rating. Starting off with Memento. If you liked Tenet or in general are a fan of Christopher Nolan's directorial style, then you will definitely enjoy Memento as well. One of Nolan's first movies, it perfectly exemplifies his non-linear narrative style that he would later adopt in much of his later work. Memento tells the story in reverse. It begins with the ending. The next scene is the one right before the ending, and so on and so on until we get to the beginning. On top of it being a very interesting way to tell a narrative, it also helps the viewer better relate to the main protagonist who suffers from retrograde amnesia. He is unable to form new memories and must rely on a convoluted system of notes and pictures to support him. Thus, like the protagonist, the viewer knows only what is happening and what will happen, but has no idea how he got to that point. It is a movie which I think everyone needs to see at least once. It is unique, it is very engaging, and it is, maybe ironically, very memorable. Check it out and I guarantee you that you won't be disappointed. Birdman for me personally, Birdman is one of the most quintessential movies of the contemporary cinema. It is a movie about art itself, artist versus critic, artist self-expression and sacrifice. What constitutes good art? Is it the small and meaningful place or is it the great onslaught of spectacle that are the action movies? All of these are themes in Birdman. On top of a thought-provoking story, it has a great cinematography and great acting. The one-shot technique is incredibly technically challenging and when done well, as in Birdman, can serve to better immerse the audience in the act, making them feel as part of the scene. 1917 would employ the same technique later, however, between the two I enjoyed Birdman more. And to top it all off, Birdman has a spectacular soundtrack. If my excessive use of background music had not made it apparent, I love solo jazz percussion. Birdman is a must-see movie. I highly recommend it. Wes Anderson is easily one of my favorite directors of all time. His movies can easily be enjoyed by anyone, regardless of age or background. And I would personally consider The French Dispatch to be his best movie so far. I have already made a video on this movie, where I went in greater detail to analyze and describe my liking of it. So check that one out as well. The French Dispatch consists of four anthologies which present four different articles of a newspaper. Each showcases a different story and style and serves as a flex of Wes Anderson's abilities. Pretty much as soon as I saw the movie it became one of my top favorite ones of all time. If you liked some of his work, such as The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Talented Mr. Fox or Moonrise Kingdom, then you definitely should watch The French Dispatch. It is all of that to 1000. And if you haven't seen anything from him, watch this one still. His style is very idiosyncratic and has influenced many photographers and filmmakers alike. Satoshi Kon's work may at first put off a lot of people due to it being animated, however, I think it is because of this medium that he is able to tell stories which would not be possible in a live-action movie. Sadly, his filmography is quite short as he died at the age of 46 of cancer. Of all his work, I think Perfect Blue sticks out as his best one. If you can look past the anime style and anime tropes, this movie will easily lure you in with its marvelous symbiosis of visuals and narrative. Satoshi Kon work has been very influential to many directors around the world. For example, Christopher's Nolan Inception takes many scenes shot for shot from Kon's Paprika. Likewise, some elements from The Black Swan were directly influenced by Perfect Blue. And for a good reason, I think there is no better movie which shows the schism between public and private life. The editing and seamless transitions work so perfectly to confuse the viewer and thus relate the protagonist's dissociation. There are some minor problems here and there, but overall I think this movie is worthy of being called one of the best movies of all time. The Truman Show When I first saw Jim Carrey was playing the main character, I expected a somewhat light-hearted comedy movie. However, I couldn't have been more wrong. The Truman Show tells the tale of a man, Truman, whose whole life since birth has been a TV show. 
A whole town has been constructed for this purpose where everyone but Truman is actors. The story focuses on his awakening, his journey to realizing the truth about his world. And this movie, alongside the eternal sunshine of a spotless mind, solidified Jim Carrey as a great actor in my mind. The Truman Show ultimately faces the viewer with the question whether it is better to live in a controlled lie or an unpredictable truth. The story aside, there are some really great shots and moments which have really stuck with me ever since I watched it about 6 years ago. If you enjoy movies of a similar vein like Forrest Gump, then give this movie a go. I know Guy Ritchie can be a bit of a controversial director. Not for any racist statement of his, that I know of at least. No, he's somewhat of a controversial director because he's seen as a talentless hack. And yeah, his filmography is a bit of a hit or miss situation, but I think his greatest hit has to be Snatch. It is the movie that really put Guy Ritchie out there as a director. And his latest movie, The Gentleman, tries to recreate the same experience that Snatch was able to produce nearly 20 years prior. If you enjoyed any of his movies, check out Snatch. I think it is his magnum opus. It features a star cast like Brad Pitt, Jason Statham and Radhi Serbagia. The movie is his signature unpredictable gangster story with several plot lines competing for your attention. It has great, almost caricature characters and plenty of action. If you enjoyed some of Tarantino's earlier works such as Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, then Snatch is definitely for you. I think this next movie needs no introduction nowadays. American Psycho has become a cultural phenomenon. Even after over 20 years from its release, people are still actively discussing it and engaging with the movie. Its story has managed to remain relevant. Even visually, the movie doesn't feel dated in the slightest. And to top it all off, the movie has one of the greatest performances in modern cinema. Christian Bell is easily my favorite actor of contemporary cinema. Though he's perhaps better known for his role in The Dark Knight, I think his best performance is his portrayal of American Psycho's protagonist, Patrick Bateman. The movie is without a doubt very memorable. I have yet to meet a person who after seeing the movie was not moved by it. What surprised me is that, despite it being a critique of this highly vain and superficial lifestyle, many seek to become like Patrick Bateman. There are workout tutorials, skincare routines, even restaurant lists inspired by this movie. Without a doubt you have heard of this movie. If you are putting off watching it due to its more gory scenes, I can assure you that they are quite mild. I watched American Psycho with two very squeamish female friends of mine and they both enjoyed it thoroughly. In the spirit of Sigma male movies, uh, Fight Club. Another very iconic and highly influential movie. Its plot twist, not to spoil it for you if you haven't watched it, has been copied by many other directors and writers. Fight Club is a dark satire of modern consumerism and a suppressed need to express hypermasculinity. And with the incredible director that is David Fincher, the movie is nothing short of a masterpiece. I'll be surprised if you had not seen it yet, but if you're one of the few lucky ones, prepare yourself for a movie that will leave you thinking about it for weeks after your viewing. I have been a fan of Bong Joon-ho's work ever since I saw his Memories of a Murder, but none of his following movies managed to capture me until Parasite. And I don't think I'm alone on this. Parasite won Best Picture in the 2019 Oscars for a good reason. It is a typical Bong Joon-ho movie focusing on the class struggle between those with means and those without. It has some incredible scenes and yeah, it's a really good movie. If you have already seen Parasite, do also check out Memories of a Murder, which was one of his very first works. I think nowadays it is impossible to make a list of great movies without having at least one by Quentin Tarantino. His gory style can put some people off, but he is still without a doubt one of the best directors of modern time. And my favorite movie of his definitely has to be his cowboy take on World War II, Inglorious Bastards. The opening scene is brilliant. Hans Kuloner Landa is such an iconic character and Christopher Waltz does a spectacular job of portraying him. And I think everyone knows the bar scene where the English spy is exposed because he orders three beers with the wrong gesture. Building a suspenseful scene around German accents and gestures is just a flex of masterful writing. There are of course plenty of other great moments and many incredible shots. It is definitely not a movie for everyone, but I would say it best highlights Tarantino's style while also remaining a very entertaining watch. On the topic of war movies, a personal favorite of mine is Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. I think some war movies and action ones in general can end up glorifying or misrepresenting violence. But the opening sequence of Saving Private Ryan, which depicts the D-Day, shows how chaotic, how indiscriminate, how scary war can be. In contrast to Full Metal Jacket, it focuses more on the combat and doesn't spare the gritty visuals. 
It reminds me of Wilfred Owen's poem Duque de Coromest, mainly because of the emotional effect it had on me. I know the movie can be a bit hard to stomach due to its more gruesome scenes, but I think this is one of the movies everyone needs to see at least once in their lives. Kubrick needs no introduction, he is easily the most recognizable director in cinema's history. However, even though I enjoyed his movies for their visual aesthetic, they always felt cold, the characters hard to perceive as people. Ironically, the most human of his movies is about the dehumanizing nature of war. Full Metal Jacket contains some of my favorite shots in all movies on this list. It also has, in my opinion, the most engaging story of all the other Kubrick movies. Full Metal Jacket, despite being about war, shows very little action. Instead it focuses on Joker's encounters with war's effects on people. With the breakdown of Private Pyle to an injured Vietnamese girl begging for a merciful death. It's a phenomenal movie and its influence can be seen in many other media. For example, the drill sergeant's dialogue appears in Muse's Psycho from their album Drones. While the West has Kubrick, the Soviet bloc had Andrei Tarkovsky. He is hailed as one of the best directors of the 20th century and I think he perfectly deserves that title. Of all his work, my favorite has to be his semi-autobiographical movie Zierkawa or The Mirror. Going into it, you have to be prepared to see a movie that does not adhere to established rules or trends. Instead, it feels more like a poem movie. The non-linear narrative structure is almost like a dream, with past and present events blending to the point of confusion. But that works perfectly with the plot of the movie. The mirror is about a man reminiscing about his life on his deathbed. And like the human's memory, it lacks structure and can often be almost illogical. It is definitely a bit harder to watch compared to the other movies on this list as Tarkovsky likes to be a bit too philosophical and poetic with his movies, but I still find it to be a very impactful and important work. And the great news is that you can watch it absolutely free in HD quality, completely legally right here on YouTube. As a small warning though, the English captions are not always accurate and can sometimes even miss an entire line of dialogue. But there are probably other versions out there with better subtitles. I grew up watching Charlie Chaplin's movies. In the late afternoons I would watch them with my grandfather who didn't speak a lick of English. Still we were both able to laugh our hearts out due to the almost pantomime nature of Chaplin's work. And if I had to pick a favorite among all of them, I would have to pick The Great Dictator. It satirizes the Nazi regime and especially Hitler, who is called Hinkel in this movie. The speech by Hinkel is a masterful display of visual comedy. What surprised me the most is that Chaplin began work on this movie all the way back in 1930, when Hitler was still not seen as the ultimate villain as most of the western world had not yet declared war on Germany. As a main critique I would have towards this movie, which is common for most of Chaplin's work actually, is that the middle part is a bit weak and seems almost unrelated to the main plot. There is always some romance with some girl and prolonged scenes of them flirting. Still, I would consider it to be one of the best satires made to date, something that Jojo Rabbit, albeit a great movie, couldn't quite achieve. Of a similar vein but a bit more modern is Jacques Tati's magnum opus Playtime. It tells the story of a man who struggles to adapt to an increasingly modernized Paris. It thus serves as a subtle critique of hyperconsumerism masked under the veil of a vaudeville. Playtime is a very unique watch, where the viewer is left to experience the ensuing chaos of the movie's world all at once. There are things happening all over the screen and it can be a bit overstimulating. Video Game Donkey made a great video on this movie, so to keep this video to a manageable length, I will recommend you watch his video too for a more in-depth view of Playtime. All I would like to add is that it is a great combination of flawless cinematography, visual comedy and ensemble staging. Sadly, Tati's work is perhaps not so well known in modern times. Maybe it is because of the language barrier, since his movies are in French or because of their very slow pace. However, I think everyone, not just cinephiles, should see this movie as they offer an incredibly unique experience which no other film can rival. If you aren't familiar with Paul Thomas Anderson's work, There Will Be Blood is the place to start. His style is certainly incredible, but unlike the other Anderson on this list with his hyper stylization, Paul Thomas Anderson focuses on more slow dramas with a lot less intense framing and editing. His movies are certainly beautiful though, so many wonderfully memorable shots for me have come from his work, and his films almost enter the realm of vibe movies. There Will Be Blood tells the tale of a rivalry between two powerful characters portrayed by Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Dano. Both deliver the performances of their life here. It is no surprise that Lewis won an Oscar for his portrayal of Daniel Plainview. As is with most PTA movies, the focus is more on the characters rather than on the plot. 
Though the story is still interesting, a tale of how greed ends up consuming people, leaving them broken men. If you have never seen a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, watch There Will Be Blood. It best highlights the style of his later work. Other movies by him would also be, for example, The Master with Joaquin Felix. To switch gears a bit, 500 Days of Summer. Although technically a romance movie, it is more of a critique on such movies and the modern manufactured romantic experience in general. I have read that some people don't like the movie because the protagonist does not end up with the girl in the end. But that is precisely the point of the movie. It diverges from the mainstream by showing that some relationships don't work and no party is at fault. People can just be incompatible. I think the fact that people still view 500 Days of Summer as a romantic comedy attests to how good this movie is. It starts like any normal romantic flick. The boy meets the manic pixie dream girlfriend. But it quickly diverges from it. And yeah, it is also an indie wet dream with its a bit obtuse references to movies such as like The Seventh Seal or British Rock. This can this maybe man. put some people off, but still give it a try and you may fall in love with it as much as I did. There is something special about Ghibli movies. They are like little pastries, soft and sweet on the palate. They radiate a warm and pleasant atmosphere, inviting you to sit, relax and enjoy a great movie. Ghibli movies remind me of the old Disney movies, before Disney went to shit. And I wouldn't call them kids movies. Sure, childish yes, but not for children. I still enjoy the old Disney Aladdin as a very entertaining movie. Personally, the first Ghibli movie I saw, House Moving Castle, left the greatest impression on me. It has spectacular visuals, interesting characters design and great music. I did find the story and its message a bit stupid, but I guess that is the childish part of Ghibli movies. But this is a movie I recommend exclusively for the visuals and the viewing experience, or the vibes, rather than an immersive story. Edgar Wright's work sticks out to me from the endless sea of comedy action movies. His trilogy with Simon Peck has easily some of the best comedic moments in recent cinema, and I don't think that anyone else would have been able to do such a great adaptation of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. But for the list, I have chosen to include an action movie of his that focuses less on the comedy and more on the drama element. I am talking of course about Baby Driver. Originally, I did the foolish mistake of not watching it because of the title. Baby Driver came out at the same year as Boss Baby and for some reason my monkey brain thought that they would be somehow of the same vein. But when I saw who the director was, I immediately got a ticket for it and watched it in my local cinema. This movie highlights Edgar Wright's directorial style the best. Fast paced action scenes, long shots for more important moments and perhaps most important of all, the inclusion of music as part of the action. Shot transition and even minor actions happen to the beat of the song being played. The music, which usually is left in the background of a movie, has now been brought to the center stage. Everything else follows its direction, and this is woven really nicely with the plot itself. This creates a very pleasant and unique experience. Maybe this is just a personal thing, because as a musician I am always paying extra attention to the music that's being played, but I digress. Watch Baby Driver, I promise you it will be worth it. I know it's a bit unorthodox to put a superhero movie in such a list. I think superhero movies, partially because of the comics which were aimed at young children, partially because of the new Marvel movies, tend to be viewed as less than art. But I would consider the Batman, among the Joker and Watchmen, to be exceptions to the general rule. Despite it being about a superhero, the movie is one of the best mystery crime thrillers I have seen in recent years. I have already made a video extensively praising it, so I will keep it short here. The cinematography is absolutely gorgeous. The acting by Paul Dano and Robert Pattinson is incredible. The story has some issues for me, but overall I would say it was pretty okay. As a drawback, I would say that it is a bit lengthy, having a runtime of almost 3 hours. But I think it can draw you in well enough that you don't feel those 3 hours passing by. And that concludes the list. If you have any movies you would have wanted to see in this list, leave them in the comments. I would love some movie recommendations and I do genuinely enjoy finding a previously unseen good film. And thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and a subscribe as it greatly helps out my channel. Making this list and the reception to my last video inspired me to make more detailed analysis of some of these movies. So yeah, stay tuned and I will see you in the next video.